I'm Helen Williams, and this is The Coach for the Coach, Connecting the Dots. Well, welcome everybody to your normal Sunday viewing A Coach for the Coach. I am your coach, Helen Williams, and we've got a great show uh, for you today. Uh, the team that I want to shout out, though, like I normally do, is uh, Cheney University, uh, Coach Tammy A. Bagby, doing some really good things there. So we want to give her uh, her props and wish her well uh, this season. If you want to get in touch with me, follow me on social media, HMW Sports for YouTube and also for Twitter. Follow me at a coach for the coach on Instagram and then also a coach for the coach, uh, my Facebook page as well. So I am excited about tonight's guest. Uh, I've known him for a long time and uh, just really, really have enjoyed our friendship and uh, his mentorship when I was coaching. And I think he has a lot of really good things um, to teach our young coaches today, especially. So uh, I'm going to bring him on, uh, Coach Richard Barron, um, head coach for the University of Maine men's basketball team. What's up, Coach? Hey, good to see you, Helen. How you doing? Good. Now, is that smile because you're seeing me, or is that a res you know residual from last night? You know, <laughs> I will be honest; it's a little bit of both. Good. <laughs> I will be honest; it's a little bit of both. It's um, it was a, it's been a very trying few years, and uh, I was excited about the results, uh, nonetheless, just like a lot of people yesterday. So, um, yeah, it's probably a little bit of both. Well, we 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 had some exchanges. Um, I'm I'm certainly uh, I'm I'm happy for all of you that get to the see some representation that you've never seen before. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's important and um it's one of the things that I appreciate about our friendship is um your um understanding of that and um you know your uh just just how you pay attention to those those things like that. So uh I want to let you know I appreciate you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we're gonna talk about coaching, uh something we both love. Um I am not coaching anymore obviously but I'm coaching coaches and one of the things about this show that I want to teach coaches is that, you know, normally with coaching, they give you a whistle and they say, welcome to the profession, but, but you do need to actually prepare and work to get better, just like you expect your players to do. And obviously you've been a head coach and an assistant. Um, most of your career, you've been a head coach, but um, I want to talk about first what your philosophy is in coaching and sort of how you came to that. Cause we'll talk about it later, but you've been to a lot of different, uh, a lot of different types of schools and work for different people. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing that kind of comes to mind is that coaching is, um, you know, it's mentorship. It's, it's, you know, very similar to parenting in some ways it's growing, right. It's, um, you know, we talk all the time about you're either getting better, you're getting worse, right. You're either growing or you're dying. Um, and I, I think that's true, you know, in, in so many things in life. And you know, coaching is is trying to make sure that you're you're growing. You know? So uh, it, I do think that you know we have a platform um, or, or subject media of, of athletics. But uh, you know, one of the things we talked about a lot at, while we were there at Princeton together was how um, athletics was co-curricular. Right? It wasn't mm -hmm. co-curricular. It wasn't in addition to the classes or you know just a hobby. Um, it was part of their education. And so we, we really value and still do, I think both of us, how much, um, how much character we can build through athletics. So uh, I think that's the, the first thing I would say about, you know, coaching in general. And then I, I think in terms of philosophies, um, I've constantly been growing and evolving, um, not always drastically, but, you know, over the years, I think I had a completely different perspective now at, at soon to be 52 um, than what I had when I started coaching when I was 22. So yeah. those 30 years have, have, have changed me. And um, you know, one of the things that, that just stands out to me and I, I did another interview earlier this week and, and it really kind of resonated when I was thinking about it, uh, you know, responding to a similar question was how fortunate I've been to have such good people around me, good players, good assistant coaches, good administrators, you know, working at the strong institutions because they allowed me to grow, right? They allowed me to make mistakes. They allowed me to, you know, um, to, I don't want to say get away with things because that's not the intent. It wasn't trying to get away with things, but just to, to be able to, to be a little bit naive or, um, you know, to, to, to grow and learn 
there's no way I would coach today the same way that I coached, you know, even 15 years ago when we were together at Princeton. So um, I, I think that's that's the same thing that we would expect from our athletes to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. you know, in the same way we talked about a player like Michael Jordan changed his game as he got older, but he was still great. I, I think that we all do that as coaches too. So what are some of the things that you focus on in terms of being able to, to evolve? Because we all need to do that as, as people in general, but are there some specific things that you look to, to for your evolution? Well, I think, I think it's a combination of two things. One is I think you've always got to serve the institution and the team. So who are you coaching? Where are you coaching? What's required to do the job? You know, not making it about you, but how, who are you serving? And so that may require you to change, right? That may require you to, to bring a different approach. Obviously, um, you know, recruiting at Princeton was very different than recruiting at Baylor, uh, but there was some overlap. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you know when I first went to Baylor, um, you know, Shanae Agumake was one of the people we were really targeting and recruiting, spent a lot of time in, in her living room. Um, excuse me, it was NECA at the time. Uh, NECA was the oldest. And so, you know, but that was also someone we would have targeted at Princeton very much. You know, we would have loved to have had her at Princeton too. So it wasn't that there was an overlap. It's just the process was very different. And so, you know, learning your your institution and how to do that job, um, it isn't really just about you and, and, and kind of what you want to do. It's really about how you serve the institution, serve the team, serve the needs of the players. That can be true with X's and O's and stuff too. So I always think that it's a whole lot easier for me to change, right, me, uh, not that it's easy, but it's just easier than it is for me to change 18 to 25 other people, you know, especially if they're, you know, many of them are 17 to 22 years old. Right. Right. Um, so so I, I've, I've adjusted to, you know, um, trying to figure out how I can have a different approach. Um, I just feel a lot more in control, too, when I do that. So I feel like it's really important um, you know, that I spend that time really focusing on on, on you know, what I'm doing. So that's the first thing. I think the, the second thing is um, always just asking yourself, you know, am I doing a good job? Am I, are we getting better or worse? What could I do better? Uh, the, the, a real sense of accountability that, you know, while we we're trying to serve, you know, the team, the organization, the school, and we're thinking about their needs, we're putting it on our shoulders. So we're accepting responsibility for the outcome. And that's really important too. You know, we can't just blame everybody else. We can't say, well, if I only had, you know, a, a seven foot center, if I only had a, you know, a player like the all conference, you know, kid who plays at Vermont or whatever it is, right? We, um, you've got to find a way to be successful despite everything else. And so I spend a lot of time kind of in my head, you know, talking to myself, just asking that question, how am I doing? What, you know, if I could do that again, would I do it the same way? You know, um, is that how, how do I feel like this relationship is going? You know, do I know that or am I feeling that? Have I asked that question? You know, um, do I really know the answer? So I think it's a lot of it's just kind of questioning yourself. Yeah, I don't think we as coaches are uh, self-reflective or self-aware enough. Um, I think we need to spend more time with that and be more intentional um, in terms of what you just talked about with the players as well. Am I is this relationship going the way that it should, you know, should I make changes so that I can help this player get the best out of himself or, or herself? Well, especially today. I mean, the way this generation learns and communicates, um, the amount of time they spend on screens, you know, um, whether it's their phone or computer, the way they, you know, um, you, you might be able to have a really in-depth personal connecting sort of a conversation with them through a text message where for me, that would seem impersonal. For them, it's more comfortable. You know, an in-person meeting might be threatening and awkward. You know, they may, they may feel like they're, they're being judged in a way or something, you know, getting called into the office, that thing. Yeah. Uh, and and for, for them, that's not how they would talk to their friends. They wouldn't say, we have to see each other. They would just start texting, right? Or they would, you know, uh, whatever, you know, um, direct FaceTime message. or something like that, yeah. Whatever they're doing, it would be through a screen probably. Right. So uh, I think for us to, again, you know, instead of trying to make everybody adjust to the way I would communicate or what I think is best, it's a lot easier for me to be a little bit malleable and, and, and you know, just always say, you know, the goal is to, 
to get better. You know, so if my um, stubbornness, my, you know, my rules or my deliberateness is helping us get better, then that's a good thing. If that, if that discipline teaches in a way that, that helps us, that's great. If it's not, then, then I need to, I need to adjust. Have you had any issues just sort of adjusting to the technology piece in, in terms of communication? I know that's one of the things that I found very difficult was I, I just didn't feel like there was a connection unless I brought a kid into the office. Now I would make sure that I didn't sit behind my desk because I didn't want to be like it was the principal's office. You know, I would purposely sit next to them or uh, away from that, that sort of scenario to help them feel comfortable. But I found that really difficult um, to, to adjust to the technology piece of it. I think the thing that's been difficult, really, it hasn't so much been the adjustment to technology. It's more the impact and that, you know, we have, let's say it's four hours of time with these players a day, you know, five, six days a week, right? At the most, right? So um, then, then occasionally you've got some time on the road, maybe. This year, obviously, is going to be very different. But, right. uh, but you know, so for the most part, we're, you know, we have 20 hours of, of accountable act you know, athletic activity a week. And, and we might have, you know, a few more hours just around that, you know, um, whether it's talking to someone in the training room or, you know, visiting with them after or before practice, that kind of thing. So, um, but everybody else has access to them the other 20 hours a day. So whether it's Twitter, messaging, Facebook, chat rooms, you know, um, the media, everybody can get to the kids. And so, that's, I think, the biggest adjustment is that you, you've got to be so good in your four hours to combat yeah. everything that's going to happen in the other 20. Um, and it's not that everything in the other 20 is always going to be bad or always going to be have a, uh, you know, some sort of uh, bad intentions. It's just that, that a lot of people that are going to be throwing that stuff out there don't understand team. They, didn't, they don't even know what's going on in practice. They don't know, you know. Right. Um, even parents who love their kids more than anything in the world tend not to, you know, know everything that's going on in a practice, right? They don't know that the player's not working as hard as they can or that they were 15 minutes late or, you know, any of the other stuff. They don't they don't get all that information. So I think that's probably the, the hardest thing, um, the biggest adjustment that, that's happened is just how how bombarded kids are you know, with, with information, with opinions. And so how that affects not only their performance on the court, but how that also impacts their performance in the classroom, their responsibilities there. Um, you know, uh, the, even the, the, the impact of social media on, we, I know this is kind of maybe a few years ago sort of lesson, but, but the impact of what you put out there and how it lasts forever, right? There's yeah. the, the digital copy of it now that that's, out there forever. So if you, whether it's, you know, off color remarks or a joke or even retweeting lyrics, we, you know, we've all seen kids who've done that and it can have a really big impact. It's something that they, they don't understand the consequences for. So that there, these things are really, really powerful devices. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and I don't know that, 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 uh, that our young players fully understand you know, the implications and they shouldn't, they're still, you know, 18 to 22, they're, they're becoming adults. They're not, they're not adults yet. And so, you know, I think, I think sometimes the, the consequences are a little extreme relative to the age and their understanding of responsibility, but that just makes our job to teach them that all the more important. Yeah. So, so during those four hours, are you intentional about combating those other 20? Like, how do you, how do you do that? I am. You, you're, you're probably going to say, "Yeah, you you are." Uh, I am the king of analogies, right? So yes, you are. <laughs> I, I'm constantly trying to connect with them by making some sort of analogy, some sort of parallel to something they may they may identify in their life, so they can connect the dots, right? Um, that's. But I, I do believe that we're always teaching life lessons, and. I'm far more intentional about building our culture now than ever before. I, would, I think I was, I was always 
kind of at, at schools where there was strong culture. We recruited kids of, of, of high character. Um, but I'm, I'm a little more deliberate now than ever before, probably because of that, you know, that, that it's something we have to constantly be communicating. And uh, one of our quotes in practice this week was um, from Confucius that said, you know, I, uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase it here. I, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. And so, you know, trying to help them through those steps and just understand saying it once isn't enough, you know, being able to, you know, I told you that in practice is not good enough as a coach. Mm. Yeah. Well, and, and that, the, the, the culture word is something that's thrown around all the time. And I, I think, how do you develop that? I know young coaches come, they hear that or a young head coach or, something like how, how would you give advice in terms of how to build a culture? Well, I think first you have to know what it is you want, right? What you have to define it. So what is, what does that culture look like? Right. Um, I think that's critical to, to all of this. So uh, I think there's both the, the culture of what you want your team to look like on the court and also what you want your team to look like off the court. Because sometimes you can have one that's really good and the other isn't. And I think they're both important. Uh, so should they think, be the same? Well, in some ways, yes. I think, you know, like integrity, right? Integrity on the court, the way we play the game, the integrity off the court, the way we handle our academics. I mean, those those things may that may be true for both. And integrity is a, a big thing for me. Right. So I would hope that that's part of our team's culture. But it's not just putting it. It's not just writing the words down. Culture has to be defined and then it has to be acted out. So we have to we have to describe it we have to show it we have to praise it right um and i think that our our, our guys really are starting to to understand that um you know how we've done a good job of the last two years really defining our culture off the court we really you know school best in terms of team gpa and all that kind of thing you know kids are doing really well um, very involved in, in in social organizations around campus and leadership and stuff like that, really making a very positive impact on our community, a lot of community service. So they've done a, a marvelous job of, of kind of buying in there. But I think the the where we need to do better is our buy-in in terms of team play, in terms of culture, how we play, what we are always going to do, what are our non-negotiables, right? Um, you know, if if somebody, you know, tried to say, uh, you know, if the, if the charge was that the University of Maine men's basketball team was a team that played together and played hard and played selfishly, would, would somebody have enough evidence to convict us, right? If they, whether it's pulling up game tape or practice tape, you know, would, would, would they be able to prove it if that was the charge? So um, it really is about an action. It isn't about a slogan on a t-shirt it isn't about words on the wall it isn't about a pamphlet that you hand out at the beginning of the season it isn't about team rules that you sign and then you know put away in a drawer yeah. it's about your actions every day you know who are we what do we bring what do we you know accept every day um and and just because something doesn't necessarily conform with the culture there may be some sort of judgment and discussion to bring back but there still has to be an element of grace you know there still has to be enough room to make mistakes and still feel like, you know, you don't want people to walking around on eggshells either. Right. So, um, and, and I think, you know, more and more, I'm, I'm trying to get our players to help define that culture and trust that they're going to, that they're good kids and they're going to come up with it instead of just telling them what it should be, you know, um, as a coach, I don't want to, I don't want this just to be Richard Barron's 10 principles. And then I've got to go find, you know, players who are going to at least, tacitly agree with them, you know, and to get through four years of playing it, you know, at Maine. So uh, I really want it to be about them and, and what do they want it to look like? And then I'm there to help them get there. Yeah. So, so there's better buy-in when they're uh, part of the process. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now it takes, it's, it's harder to do it because it isn't necessarily instinctive for them or they don't always get what you mean. You've got to try a few times, you know, you got to keep trying. Um, so, it, it, I don't want to say that it's easy, you know, but, uh, yeah. you know, it is a whole lot easier just to say, okay, these are going to be, this is what our culture is going to be and write, you know, one through five and, you know, 
get a poster slapped on the wall or get some t-shirts made up. Um, but, but that ain't going to take, that ain't going to mean much. How, how do you balance that with the responsibility and, and really the, the pressure and stress to be successful too? Because we all know that, I mean, that's, that's part of the deal is to have, you know, a successful program. And we tell our kids, listen, you need to be patient. You'll get your playing time. You need to, you know, you need to grow here. You need to grow there. But in reality, you know, we'd like for that to happen, but we're not as patient as head coaches because we want some results. So it's kind of, it's, it's kind of, you can't have it both ways, but how do you reconcile that? Well, I think that's, I think you just said it. You can't have it both ways. You've got to pick which kind of coach you're going to be. And uh, there are some who are probably, you know, kind of, I don't know, a little more totalitarian, you know, it's this way or the highway you're either producing or you're gone, you know, um, there's not a whole lot of nurturing necessarily that goes on with in those organizations, but it's really just about, it's transactional, right? It's what do you bring to the table? You bring this level of athleticism. I'm going to, I'm going to run certain plays and sets to put you in a situation. You're either going to produce or you're not um, you either, you either getting better or you're, you're getting out. And it's, it's pretty straightforward. And some people thrive in that sort of very clearly defined um, expectation. And, and obviously a lot of people don't, right? And so you might have a program where there's high turnover um, and that may lead to winning. And I'm, it, I'm not, not disputing that, but I don't know that it's who I am. And I think it, I'm not sure that it's part of the education process that, that I believe in. Right. Um, and so I think there's a better way to win and that's together and teaching fundamentals and teaching, you know, teaching uh, you know, buy in discipline. And so that's but I can't be both. Right. If I if I look like a hypocrite to my players, right, if I if I constantly am going back and forth with them, you know, um, I think I think you lose credibility. And so. Uh, what my dad said to something to me when I was young, starting coaching, he said, you know, you can be uh, the kind of coach who, you know, people are going to run through a wall for you because they love you so much. Or you can be the kind of coach that they're going to just try to prove you wrong because they think you're an SOB. Um, but, you know, you can't be both. You got to pick one. I mean, you can't, yeah. you, you know, um, and I, and I'm sure that, you know, almost all sort of, uh, leadership positions, that's probably true to some extent, right? There's a, there has to be a certain authenticity, but there also has to be a certain consistency, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. For everybody else to, to know how to work around it. So part of building culture is hiring your staff. Um, yep. And when you're looking for staff, just for our young coaches, um, what, what kinds of things do you look for? And can you tell our younger coaches who want to be a head coach, what types of things they should be doing um, to, to put themselves in a position to, to reach their goal? Right. Well, I think, you know, on the outside, most people look at things in, in, in a very simple sort of, you know, someone was a third assistant and they become a second assistant, this sort of linear progression. Right. Um, and, and that's not real life. That's that, that, that leads to a lot of bad hires and, you know, um, just because someone's good in sales doesn't mean they're a good manager. Right. So, um, you know, sometimes you can promote someone out of a position that they're really good at, you know, into a position they're not really good at. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, then there are other people who like, uh, you take someone like an Eric Spalestra, you know, who, who, who gets in at the ground level and just proves his worth in every position. Right. So I think regardless, I think wherever you are, you want to make you want to make yourself um, indispensable, right? That you're you're doing such a good job that that you know the organization couldn't lose you. Right? That's number one. Um, but in terms of filling positions, I look for what does the team need? What do what is you know what do I need? What what are we trying to accomplish? Um, so it's not necessarily what everybody else would would look at, you know. Um, I may, I may have a real strong sense of, of where we're going to be going with recruiting um, over the next few years, and or feel even like that might be my strong suit. And I need someone who's going to help do something different, right? Versus other people might look at 
a hiring position, like, well, that has to be a recruiting coordinator, right? There's, we put a lot of titles on it. Um, I, because of that, because I, I, I believe, and you probably remember this um, very well, I would guess that uh, we share all the duties on my staff. So um, we don't, you know, I want my assistants to, to one, be engaged. I can't ask for their counsel if they have no level of experience, right? It, so um, everybody does scouts. Uh, everybody does, you know, recruits. Everybody um, is involved in position work or practice planning. You know, we want it to be collaborative in what we do. So in order to value their opinion, I have to give them experiences that make their opinion valuable. And so it, others do it very differently, right? Some people are uh, very territorial in terms of their work. You know, and everybody kind of gets into their silo and, and, and you know, works works alone and, and, and that may be a good way to do it. It's just not for me because I want it, I want a more team approach. So um, then I think also, you know, trying as best I can to ask enough good questions to know is someone a good fit. You're not always going to get it right. And it's not always fair to try to make judgments, right, on on whether somebody might be a good fit. But to ask enough questions about, uh, you know, how how people have gotten to where they are, how they make decisions, what do they value, you know, how they see things going, right? Um, what what would they like out of this position? What would they like out of this career? And so uh, that's always been, you know, kind of how I've made the decision. It's been a little bit, uh, I like I like to really kind of have an idea of who it is and what I want. And you know that and I, I, when I've really targeted you, you know? So yeah, I, I, you recruited me. I didn't even know I was being recruited. <laughs> right, right. You know, um, but it's I, actually when it, before I was recruiting you, I guess I was interviewing you, and you didn't know you were being interviewed, right? So yeah, yeah uh, true. But that's uh, you know that's true. I mean, it's just relationships. It's just getting to know people, and 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 to be able to do that with you without you knowing that a job was maybe you know at stake, right? Changed the way we talked. Right. There was a, it was a, a much more comfortable and honest conversation when we were just getting to know each other. And then I brought up the job, not the job first. Right. Which would have put up some walls and, you know, it, we would have both been posturing a little bit. Right. So I, I've, I've tried to do that, you know, in, in my hires and in, um, in, in my current staff. One of the things that was really important was buy-in to Maine and belief in Maine. I felt like it was really important that we had a staff that, that loved the university and loved the opportunity. And so all three of my assistant coaches had either been at Maine, played at Maine or worked at Maine, you know, before. So Igor Rosina was a prep school coach at the Academy. Um, and several of his players were on the team at Maine at the time. Um, really good program, uh, prep school program, the net sack up there and lead uh, Maine. Not not too far, a little bit north of uh, here near Lincoln. Um, Adisha Curry, who is now not the only woman on a men's staff anymore. Thank goodness uh, Loyola uh, has joined the club with Tiny Adams. But uh, Eddie had been on my staff on the women's side, so she knew the university and knew me, so she knew what she was getting into. You know, um, and Kevin Reed, who. Uh, was a great player at Maine and was a local high school coach at the time. Um, but uh, somebody who I thought was a great example of what our players would, you know, should want to be. He was a terrific player. He's a, um, had a professional career overseas, primarily in Belgium, came back and uh, married uh, three kids, great father, great husband, just a really, you know, um, wholesome sort of, image of what you can be if you go play basketball at Maine. He went to St. Thomas Aquinas, another NEPSAC school. So he you know, came from a strong basketball background as well. So um, that just, I think that meant a lot to me was having people who I didn't have to worry about their happiness or, you know, their being, being further away or geographically isolated or whatever it was. I knew that they wanted to be here. So it's a great segue into um, something very interesting about you and in, in the fact that you have coached both men and women uh, in college, literally from from the beginning. Um, and so what 
what are some unique experiences that you have? Everybody's always saying, oh, is it different coaching women or men? And, and I, I don't want to go that direction. I want to talk about the unique experiences that you have, you know, coaching, coaching each gender. Well, I think, I mean, the, the, the real benefit to, you know, I, I very accidentally stumbled into coaching women's basketball. Um, it wasn't by design. It wasn't a plan. It was a, um, it was kind of a spur of the moment uh, decision to take the women's job at the school I was at. Uh, I was actually planning on leaving as an interim um, because the women's coach had, had just resigned. And so um, I, I learned so much from that experience. It was my first head job. And um, so the, but the, as I, I've gotten older and I've had more experiences, I realized how much value uh, being around women's athletic passions and the, the life lessons I learned and the, you know, the maturity that, that I was able to gain by um, working with women, the, the, the level of people that I worked with, the staff, you know, including you, Ellen, um, it, I just always was around quality people and great programs. And I, I so appreciated uh, women's athletics, especially the athletes that we got to coach and their hunger for, for getting better and their hard work and their commitment. And so, um, I, you know, I think when I think about it, it's not just any one experience, but, but, but being able to, you know, learn what I was able to learn that I would probably never would have. Right? So I was blessed. I was very fortunate that I got to coach women. Give, um, give us an example of what what you what you learned when you coaching women. Well, I mean, communication and empathy. Um, I, you know, I think the just the toughness that that, that women have that, that there's a different way to do things. I um, the, I don't know if you remember the the Kathy DeVoer book um, about the, the differences between men and women in athletics and um, yes. I don't know the title, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's a great book. Kathy DeBoer was the a, a, a Olympic level volleyball player and coach and at University of Kentucky and uh, got into athletic administration, I believe, with Sam Newton there. And uh, she may have been there at the same time that Bernadette, Bernadette Maddox was coaching with Rick Pitino at Kentucky, if I'm remembering right. But, but she had some great insight into, you know, some of the differences between men and women and these are generalizations, so they, they certainly aren't things that you can just apply across the board and say that everything is true. But but I think that there's a lot of truth to what she she had said. And there were some things that she talked about that made me uncomfortable because I felt like she someone might be describing me. Right. And and how you know she talked about when one one example was a a, a, a coach that they had. And she said something that stuck out, like he wore cologne to practice or something. Do you, I don't know if you remember that from the book, but but it was the way the way he saw girls that he was coaching or the young women that he was coaching was just was very different than they wanted to be treated. You know okay. that they, they were there for volleyball, and you know. Um, and I don't mean that it was any, in, it was necessarily sexual. I don't think that was her, her point, but it was just um, that there was some sort of masculinity that he was trying to, he was basically performing, right? Acting, mm -hmm. for them, right? Mm -hmm. And that that was how he was going to get their respect. And she said, no, that's not it at all. You know, we want to learn, about it. <laughs> you know, we want, or, or if it could have been basketball, she was also a basketball player. But, um, but, you know, specific stories. I think I think some of the conversation, just conversations I've had with players, uh, you know, where they they've shared with me or, or um, been honest enough in their their conversation that they've let me in to, to how I feel and how I think it's an eye open, you know, and um, those experiences have made me so much better at understanding other people. Now I I mess up at it. I'm not always good at it. And um, sometimes I stick my foot in my mouth and say the wrong thing, but but I used to catch myself a little bit quicker now, right? I no, <laughs> stop mid sentence or or apologize the next day or whatever it is. Yeah, 
So I'm going to preface this with a story about when I was working for you, uh, working with you, you used to bring, you had uh, baby twins yeah. and at Princeton. And after every game, you would bring one of the twins uh, into the postseason and uh, into the post game um, uh, meeting. And I always wondered first why you did that. Um, I know family is important to you, but, but what were you trying to teach your players and your coach, coaching staff? And now that your kids are older and they've had an opportunity to be around the women's teams and the men's teams, what, what, what is that teaching them? Yeah. So, um, the, the twins, <laughs> I, you know, I'm extremely competitive, right? And so, you know, I can, I, I get heated. I get into the game. I expect to win, you know, I, I, I whether it's being upset about a call or poor execution or whatever it is, those, those things I can, I can overreact to something like that. It's not that big a deal on the, you know, in, in life really, but, but to a coach in that moment, it seems like a huge deal. And I always just knew that if I was holding one of my, my little girls that I, w I was going to feel differently, right? There's just a calmness that comes over you and, and I wasn't going to go in and, and, and it reminded me that even though they were, you know, an 18 to 22 year old young women, they were somebody's little girl. And so, you know, how do I talk to them? How do you know, how do I um, uh, talk about their performance, their game, whether we won or lost or whatever? So that was part of it. You know, um, it was it, it just kind of I don't know uh, centered me in a way. Right? Okay. Um, but uh, my kids growing up around you know some some really neat people, and it's funny you. Know, we were just in Hawaii this year with our team um, right after Christmas. And uh, Elisa Meda came to the game with her little children and sat at, sat at the game with, with my kids that she used to babysit. And so, you know, just to think how, you know, the girls turned 17 in a couple of weeks. Um, and, you know, wow. it's hard to believe, right? But, uh, you know, that um, to, to see, to see it was almost like you know three generations kind of thing at least than the kids than, than her kids um so that was that was great fun to you know to be able to see her and see that connection so all my, all my kids have grown up with some great role models and um a, a very healthy respect for both women's and men's sports i think they've enjoyed this transition back to the men's side um for me they've enjoyed having the guys around too which is great you know um and so uh, i think I think we we always have the team over for dinner and, and stuff like that and, and they all have their favorites you know they they all kind of uh have those connections with certain players and and uh, really enjoy having them over and they they've always liked the women too you know i mean it was it wasn't a it wasn't like one was better than the other sort of thing it's just they've just had some great role models in their life for my kids and uh, every time to, and that's true not just here in this sort of setting at our house, but also whether it's coming to practice or um, in the summers, you know, being able to have people, um, you know, come over and do some sort of main activities, whether it's go out on the boat or tubing or fishing or things like that. And, and they really enjoy that as well. And they, they know that they're part of our family. So um, they, they treat them as such. They look forward to seeing them. Do you think they pick up different lessons from, from the different genders? Yeah, and and my well, I don't know about from the different genders. That probably have to ask them that question. But they they definitely pick up lessons, and they also learn. You know, they we include them not in every conversation, but they, you know, Mo and I talk. Um, you know, she was a coach, so uh, she certainly understands the job and wants to know how things are going. And so, um, just like any you know, a couple talking about work at the end of the day. Um, I might share with her what's going on and, and our kids are learning from both the good and bad things that, you know, yeah. players are, are you know doing, making the mistakes they might make or, um, you know, I, I hope that that's something that, that, you know, it's kind of rubbing off on them. I think it is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of my kids. They, they do a, 
they do a great job in school. They're, they're very respectful. They're, um, they're disciplined athletes. They're, they're, they're as good athletes as, as they got their DNA from their mom and, you know, as aspiring an athlete as they got their DNA from their dad. So I, I want to finish on this one point. Obviously, we've um, had a historic election um, yeah. and uh, going to have the first woman um, vice president. And I'm curious as to um, how, what's the best way to say this, um, how you will use that to te teach leadership to your son and to your, and to your men's basketball program. Because we obviously see the, you know, the benefit of the, of the young women seeing her in that position. But there, there's also, I was think, benefits in terms of learning leadership uh, for your son and for your, for your players. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think, I think for Billy, my son, and, and for my players, um, they already have some very strong women leaders in their lives. And, you know, um, Mo is a great mom and a, and a, a, a great leader and great example, of, you know, that he's all, always had in his life. Um, and, and Eddie is a woman of color and, and uh, a woman who is very strong and, and uh, confident and, and assertive that Billy has known now for five years. Right. So, and then our players have known this is the third year that she's coached them. And I think that's probably even stronger just because it's so present. You know what I mean? It's just, it's there on a daily basis. It's not something mm -hmm. on TV right now. And then we kind of go back to, to, to our lives. So um, I think if anything, it, is a you know um, validation of their belief that this is something that should have happened a long time ago. I think most of our guys have expressed that and are extremely supportive. I think uh, Eddie was tweeting out yesterday that you know one of the um, strongest you know feelings of pride was some of her guys sending her text. She calls our players her guys, right? So she says so some of my guys are sending me text messages, you know, about how meaningful this must be for me. And so, so they get it. They they know it. They know that that struggle. So I think also, you know, everything that's happened this year, um, not just with the election, right, but with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and, and everybody else, all the social unrest has led to some very, you know, deep discussions, not just within our team, but for everybody. Right. We've had some of those discussions ourselves. And yeah. um, and so I think our guys have had you know, Eddie in that, that place all along too. And so again, this has been, a, this has been a chance for them to kind of see some normalcy in a way to what we were doing that was a little bit different, you know? Um, so I think that's been a, a, a very positive thing. Um, I, I do think, you know, that it's important for all of us to know that not everybody voted for, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And there are a lot of people, you know, there are 80 million people that did. There were 70 plus million who didn't. That doesn't mean 70 plus million people didn't want a woman vice president. And I, I, I think we have to be careful about making that sort of binary assumption that, you know, um, that that's the case. I hope, I, and you know, I'm kind of this eternal optimist. I, I hope that, that at least 75, 80% of, our entire population at least feels good about seeing a black woman vice president for the first time. Um, I, I really do believe that. I, and I do, do know that there's some people who probably aren't, aren't very happy about it. And some people who are probably even angry about it. Um, I just think they are very much in the minority. I think most people, regardless of their, their politics, um, believe and now understand the value that women bring. And that doesn't mean we don't have more work to do. We have a lot more work to do. But this is a victory we can all celebrate, regardless of who you voted for, regardless of your political affiliation, the region, the country, your gender. Um, this is a chance for all of us to celebrate because we're all going to be better having a more uh, diverse group of leaders, a, a bigger, deeper pool to pool, pool candidates from. Um, different experiences, the same way my life has been made so much better by getting to coach women 
I, I think we're seeing we're going to see that many times over for our country moving forward. Yeah. Well, that's one of the great things about sports is is you can talk about those things and 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 get a visceral understanding and um, you know what diversity is and and, and the positive things about it. So, um, hey, listen, I appreciate your time today. I mean, you just gave us so many um, great nuggets, and uh, I can't wait to watch this over again so I can um, really dig deep into some of the things that you said. But it's it's been great for the younger coaches, and uh, I really appreciate your time today. Well, absolutely. And if my staff or, or I can ever do anything to help any of your your clients or anybody who's just listening, um, you know, we're more than happy to do it. And uh, for anybody anybody out there who is thinking about working with you, Helen, I would strongly recommend they do it. I think you're a terrific person, so smart, so so uh, thoughtful, right? And um, I, I know that you're helping a lot of young coaches get off their careers on, in the right the right direction right now. So. Keep it up. Keep going. All right. I appreciate it, Richard. Thank you. Got it. All right. So there you have it. Really good conversation. Uh, if you watch this live, I encourage you to go back and, and watch it again. I think Richard gave us some really good nuggets. And uh, so thank you for joining us this Sunday. And I look forward to seeing you next week as well. If you have enjoyed the information we have provided, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. If you have a question or comment, please let me know by leaving it below. And why stop there? Click on another video and continue learning great tips from a coach for the coach.